Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Wednesday webinar with the Prophecy of Alliance. I'm doing that because I've got a Peaky Blinder on, and for those of you who know your TV series, this is a Peaky Blinder. So welcome, everybody, on that silly note to our Wednesday webinar with the Prophecy of Alliance. As always, it's so good to have you with us, our viewers, and thank you for getting in touch over the week and posing such amazing and interesting questions that we're now going to tackle. And uh, as always, such a pleasure to have Solna staying with us. How are you, Solna? I'm very good, thank you. How are you, Chris? Very well. And as always, Bruno, looking so suave there, my man. How are you doing? I'm good, and you? I just need the hat now. <laughs> little peaky blinder. That's what you need, Bruno. <laughs> a nice little bowling hat, like really old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I'm actually out in Durban. I know you guys are probably freezing, and I have just got terrific weather out here. So... <laughs> This is and amazing. The sun, for me. Is the sun still shining? No, it's not, but it oh, is good. still warm. So the sun's shining in my heart, I guess, because it's warm. Nevertheless, <laughs> 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 um, guys, it's it's so good to it's so good to see you both uh, this week. And let's let's quickly get into the questions because we do have quite a bit uh, of of material to get through. So the first question uh, is asked by a lady by the name of Berenice Adriansa, and she wants to know, she says that her mother has purchased a house and that house has, uh, has a granny flat attached to it. She says that her mom moved in last week and then discovered that the roof in this particular house and granny flat were leaking. Um, they also found out that there were leaks in both bathrooms and uh, that the water of the granny flat well, I'm assuming that the downpipe, it doesn't run into the drain. So that's obviously causing some issues with regard to the structure of the building. Um, she says that there's already a few issues on the, on, on the property itself that were not disclosed to her mom when her mother purchased the property. And her mother's already taken, uh, you know, the responsibility of replacing a few items here and there within, within the house. She wants to know that, uh, you know, what are, her, what are the chances of her mom claiming or reclaiming these, these costs that her mom has already spent, uh, as well as the possible damages that might, you know, have been incurred from this rain that happened recently. Um, can she claim it from the seller for non-disclosure? And then secondly, she wants to know that uh, should the seller have obtained uh, a plumber to, you know, issue a certificate that says that all the plumbing is in order. So I think let's, let's start with Sola on this one and then Bruno, over to you. Cool. Um, I still not, and then to Bruno, I get you, I get you. <laughs> okay, so this is going to go around food stewards. So the fact that they purchased the property and um, now they are realizing that there are defects to the property. It's, it's a little difficult to answer the question without seeing the offer to purchase. Because the truth is, as much as we always say, um, there's a general set of answers and, and principles in law. Um, when it comes to especially sale of property, your offer to purchase is very relevant. Because the, um, so, so the general rule <clears throat> would be if the property was purchased food stewards, it means food stewards means you buy it and whichever condition it's in, that's the way it's gonna be. The seller doesn't have to change or fix anything. The thing about food stewards that's very important is there are diff there are major difference between latent and patent defects. Now I'll, I won't bore our viewers with um, going into you know all the, the the detail around latent and patent defects, but the short version is if a seller purposefully hides something, food stewards won't cover that. The fact that you know. The ceiling is basically two seconds from collapsing. And now you're making a plan, eh? A poor mock a plan. A lot of other people as well, but this is a traditional thing. And if you suddenly, say, you quickly sand the ceiling and you paint it white and the world looks perfect. But you know for a fact that thing is going to collapse any second now. Purposefully hiding defects won't be covered by food stewards. You can still claim those damages from the seller thing. However, a defect that 
really the seller did not know about this. For instance, termites, and I know termites tend to be a major issue. It's not part of this question, but termites could be very far. The problem can be pretty impressively advanced without anybody knowing about it. By the time you notice termites, it's usually at that point. In those circumstances, and there's no way you're going to hold the seller liable. Now, in this instance, it's a granny flat, and it seems like the issues around the pro property isn't limited to the gr granny flat, but it seems to center around the granny flat. Now, the truth is, it could be a very bona fide mistake from the seller to not be aware of those leaks because they're not necessarily in the granny flat as often as they are in the main building. And it is, it could very well be a defect that the seller is unaware of. And in those circumstances, switch to its will, um, will be applicable and the purchaser won't have a claim against the seller. Time is also relevant. I mean, if transfer took place a year ago, the, even though we were in lockdown, remember good times last year, this time we were sort of coming out again already, like little butterflies. Um, but even, even with COVID in mind and lockdown and all the regulations, you still have time to act on something. So if a transfer took place a year ago, and you're noticing these defects now, um, it, it, it's, it's not something you're going to be able to hold the seller liable for. But also keep in mind, and now I'm sorry for all the, the sellers and the estate agents, please don't stone me. Um, but in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, if somebody had, if there was an intermediary involved in a transaction, in this situation, it would be an estate agent. There's an obligation on the seller of the thing, whatever it is, to sell a thing that is in good working order and condition. And the ideal situation would be to have a landlord disclosure form. I recommend, however, that you have options on your landlord disclosure form, your seller disclosure form, um, not just is the, the ceiling in this room um, good and well? It should be yes, no, or I don't know, maybe. A seller can't give an undertaking that the, um, the ceiling and all the, um, uh, the uh, things in the ceiling is in good working order and repair unless you get an awesome inspector out to do the inspection for you. You can't disclose, so rather say, I don't know. That safeguards the seller in the sense that if there is suddenly that goes haywire completely, at least you didn't purposefully fail to disclose that. Um, so in this particular case, if there was an agent, and in, in that case, um, in a case where the CPA then does apply, and there was um, the property was sold footsteps, but we can show that the seller must have been aware of this leak or, or all the problems that there is. There could be a chance of um, claiming damages from the seller, but I need our viewers to understand by the time you take transfer of a property to try and go back and claim damages from the seller, you can have an uphill battle on a whole new level. Make sure before you take transfer of a property that everything is, in fact, in good working order and repair. And, and I do recommend every single day of the week, whether it's an investment property or for primary residence, get a proper registered property inspector out to inspect the property on your behalf. Because you're going to look at the, oh, the garden is pretty, and you're going to think like, oh, I can see myself in this living room or whatever your thing is. Um, get somebody out that isn't getting emotionally attached to the look, but will actually inspect the property um, for defects. And I'm not a property inspector. Um, our joint good friend um, uh, it, 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 uh, is, a, is a very good property inspector and she will get into roofs and inspect every angle of a property. Um, in a way that even, uh, you know, very well, you know, experienced property lawyers won't be able to. Well, thanks, Sola. Pleasure.
Bruno, um, if there's anything you want to add to that, otherwise we'll just move quickly on to the next uh, question. Um, so, so just a very quick one on the application of the CPA. Um, maybe, maybe just to add on what Silna was was referring to. Um, remember, the CPA would apply um, in two circumstances. Number one, the state agent act acting as an intermediary. That's what Silna was specifically referring to. Certain disclosures need to be made, but obviously people aren't always aware. So you can try pass certain forms of liability or responsibility onto a purchaser up to a certain degree. If the CPA, however, applies to the sale, so it, it's two very different concepts. The relationship with the estate agent and acting as an intermediary versus the actual relationship with the seller. If the seller is a person that trades in properties um, in the course of their business and it is found that the CPA applies to that transaction, then um, there are certain um, warranties almost that the CPA um, it puts on the transaction where a purchaser may have recourse against the seller. So the what a person would need to look for in these circumstances is specifically a seller that does this as his business. Because if he does, the same rules that typically apply to buying a car and there being defects in a car when you buy it from a dealer, uh, those, uh, those uh, same rules would apply to the sale and the purchaser would have that uh, that recourse and that's why we always raise the example for uh, for instance of um, sales and execution and auctions where it's made very express that although this uh, consumer protection act applies um, you know certain regulations and general common law principles are tapped in where uh, in auctions uh, people especially sales and executions that uh, from the sheriff the sheriff uh, neither the sheriff nor the bank actually have any idea what the condition of this property is and you need to know that. And when you buy it, you take full responsibility because there is no implied warranty at, at all and no protection by the Consumer Protection Act or limited protection rather, um, if, if for instance, in those circumstances. Thanks, Bruno. Um, okay, so we'll quickly, I will swiftly run, move on to the next question, which was asked by uh, Megan Volmerans. And she, Megan wants to know, she says, Hi, I live in a sectional title double story complex. The first floor units have small outside balconies, but no awnings. There has been a request to build awnings for the 10 first floor balconies from the body corporate funds. I am not in favor of this as I feel my ground floor unit will not benefit from this upgrade at all but that the money to be used for the upgrade will come from the funds that I contribute through my levies. Uh, Megan wants to know, what is my recourse? And uh, you know, should I wish to object this? What, what can I do? Um, she does mention that you know, the trustees have suggested that a vote is taken on this subject, but she believes that the vote will obviously not be in her favor as the, you know, the owners who actually are going to have these awnings built are gonna vote in favor of it. Um, what advice can we give to uh, Megan, uh, Bruno? Uh, look, it's a bit of a difficult one because, I mean, it comes down to what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. Uh, typically, body corporates are effectively run the same way that one would run a country, in a, a democratic country at least, right? You have a whole bunch of people put together. Um, they, they elect you know, representatives or people that execute their decisions. These trustees, which are the... Uh, basically the executive or uh, like the executive, they, they run the day-to-day -day operations. They make certain decisions that they have a mandate to, to make. And most other decisions have to go back to the owners. And you can um, have these decisions like special meetings or annual general meetings. So in circumstances like this, if you apply it across the board, whatever decision needs to be made, one does need to look at whether this decision falls within the ambit of the trustees or falls within the ambit of the other owners, right? That's the first question. Now, this isn't really an operational decision. Um, this is uh, almost improvements or renovations. So typically you'd find that this would go for a decision around the owners. Now, uh, unless it's stated otherwise, if memory serves me correct, something like this, 
would probably be a normal resolution as opposed to a special resolution. Selma can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't for the life of me remember on this, like these specific type of things. But if it is a special resolution, it would be a, a majority rules situation where now it really depends on how many people are getting it, how many people aren't getting it. Um, and, you know, the, the vote under those circumstances. But now what we also need to remember is because of our legislation, there's certain protections that come along with this. So just because, and I mean, it happens very, very often where you'd have, for instance, one owner or a developer that, that stored a whole bunch of properties and he keeps getting the majority vote or a, a huge amount of the vote. So he controls everything and he doesn't necessarily always take care of the best interests of the other owners. He's, he's very selfish on his own units. And even in those circumstances, there is recourse where you can go to the ombud. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so CSOS basically, and you can approach them with a complaint and they've got certain powers. So they can review certain decisions. They can review certain rules uh, that are made based on in either invalidity or what's reasonable. Um, and they can make decisions based on that. So if it's found that this was an unreasonable decision because it, it uh, only, I don't know, it only it benefits a very few amount of people, uh, but, um, you know, for some reason, for some reason, they have the vote, so they manage to, uh, to push the vote through, that's one thing. But if it's pretty evened out, you could argue potentially that is for the, like, it's, it's the best for the building, and if there's an argument to be made of that, maybe it could be allowed. Um, but yeah, I, I, the vote is pretty much the first step to this. You'd have to first take the vote and just see how many people are for it, how many people are against it and why. And you'd have your opportunity to give your reasons. But remember, because you've chosen to give up certain rights by living in this community, this is just one of those rights that unfortunately you can get outvoted on and you just kind of need to live with it. Yes, I think, um, I think, Bruno, what, what's important to, to note as well for the viewer, <clears throat> remember an awning um, uh, on a balcony will potentially change the structure of the unit to the point where instead of this being a balcony, which is like an outside thing, it's still part of the unit, but it's a balcony that's not enclosed, the moment you enclose a balcony or a patio or whatever in sectional title you need consent from the surveyor general and the moment that happens where you um enclose in, in any way it means you you're changing the square meterage of the actual unit which has a direct impact on the participation quota now remember your levies are calculated on your pq so i i don't know what what these awnings will specifically do to this specific unit. But if it does have the effect of enclosing the patios to the point where it now forms part of the unit, it will impact the PQ, which could actually be more beneficial to your ground floor. Ugh, that, that, the language center ran out. Um, <laughs> Let's stick to one language still now, English. Okay, so when your ground floor owners then doesn't have this benefit, they maintain their normal PQ. Where the rest of the place, the, the guys that's scoring from these awnings now, if it does enclose, it will increase their PQ, which means effectively what I'm saying is they're going to pay more levies than you. So don't just look at the, but it's not going to be a direct benefit for me because I'm not being awninged. That's a term. Um, I'm not receiving any benefit. Remember, you could have a much bigger financial benefit going forward because of this. So, um, Bruno, to your point, I, I support exactly that. Um, if the vote is in favor of the awnings, please just don't go and vote without having the full facts. Understand how this will impact the PQ understand how the impact of the PQ will affect your levies. And there could be a major benefit, even though you are not receiving something cool. Oh, thank you, Solna. Thank you, Bruno, for that. Um, I'm going to quickly move on to the next question, which was asked by um, a lady with the name of Tanel Pretorius. 
And uh, it's also around a similar thing, you know, with uh, sectional title. And um, she wants to know, she says, good day. I got contacted by my managing agent from my sectional title with regards to a vote that needs to take place to decide a financial matter. She says, in 2014, the trustees signed a contract for a loan to the value of 250,000 Rand from a financial institution to cover rear levies. She says that we were informed in January, 2021, that the financial institution wants the body corporate to repay the loan as they are now charging almost 6,000 Rand in interest a month on that loan, which was taken out. She wants to know, do the trustees, oh, sorry, does the trustees alone or do the trustees alone have the power to take on a loan that is that large for that amount? And uh, she's worried that we as owners, she says, will now have to repay this loan out of our own pockets. How can owners be held responsible for, you know, others, uh, other real rent, other real ladies? That's what she, that's what she writes. Um, I think Songa, maybe you want to tackle this one for us, please. I d I'm going to do my best to tackle this one without getting upset about it. Um, because if there's one thing that really upsets me is uh, sectional title owners really ending up on the wrong side um, of a loan. Because um, once again, democracy will always have the impact that the, uh, uh, some people will take quick right now benefit decisions, which is then in the form of a loan. And then everybody else has to deal with the interest at a later stage. Um, the, the truth is, and I'm sorry uh, for offending 79 people now, um, I'm saying in advance, I'm gonna offend people. Um, loans in sectional title is the ultimate thing that people made money from um, over the past, well, since sectional title's been around. Um, the problem with that is many body corporates sell their dead books um, to collection companies, which is all good and well. But the problem is usually that runs with a loan. So the body corporate doesn't just get the benefit from selling their debt book. There is a loan attached to that. And the truth is those loans and the interest rates that they are typically running on is to the point where no body corporate can get out of that kind of debt without serious focus from all the owners and usually we won't get that because most owners doesn't understand the financial benefit in future of biting the bullet now and getting rid of that debt they add more debt because the levies are too low and the collection rate on the levies are too low so now they're living off loans and this is pretty much somebody with living off um, credit in his personal capacity, you can't get out of that day trap. And it's even worse in, in, levy, in, in levy collection situations in sectional title where the owners can't pay the levies for the stuff that they want. They want 24 hour security. They want a new fresh coat of paint every three years. They want garden services to have like freshly manicured lawns every single week these things cost money and the problem is if an owner doesn't understand your levy will always e e equate to the value that you're getting from the body corporate and from the sectional title unit it means they expect things stuff that they can't afford it's similar to going out to buy the million rand car because it's pretty but but actually you can only afford a car for 300,000 Rand. People in sectional title complexes live above their means. And unfortunately, there are companies that's able to provide credit that for lack of a better word is actually um, taking the benefit from these interest rates that they are charging body corporates um, to the extreme detriment and, and, and serious harm uh, to the uninformed owner in the sectional title complex. So that was my little brand. Answer to the viewer is unfortunately, if the if the um, body corporate decides if there's a vote, and the scary part is every single time in every single AGM where there's a vote, 
to um, increase the loan to the sectional title, the majority of the owners will vote in favor of the loan because people does not understand the actual drama they drop themselves in when they are stuck in credit. And body corporates can't get out of these uh, um, debt situations because owners vote for more and more and more credit. And unfortunately, if you don't want to um, uh, uh, be liable for the debt of previous owners, you need to make sure when you buy into a sectional title um, scheme that you do due diligence to the point where you go back and you get um, the AGM minutes of about uh, two or three years back to see how comfortably this body corporate makes decisions. And if there is a loan, to be honest, I won't buy, personally, I will not buy a property in a sectional title complex where there's an existing loan or high arrear levies without an actual plan. And your managing agent is crucial. If you have a managing agent that also runs a, a credit service on the side that will tie the credit in with this must now be your managing agent, run far for long. I didn't help this viewer at all. Bruno, don't you want to you know, take over from my rant so you can actually answer the viewer's question? Cool. <laughs> but well done. Well done. At least at least you, you set the landscape for for what like the red flags, what to look out for. All of them. <laughs> Credit. Um, so <laughs> so um, uh, fortunately, um, so I think it's section four, if I'm not mistaken. Now I can't remember. But there are um, there are certain provisions that deal with the acquisition of loans by body corporates. And if memory serves me correct, um, I can't remember the section, I'm going to lie to you, I think it's four, um, but specifically requiring a special resolution to be passed before a, a loan is actually taken out by a body corporate. Mm. So this means that it's not within the ambit of the trustee's powers to take out a loan. So that answers a portion of, of the, the viewer's question. It has to go to the owners. It's not a majority rule. It's extraordinary rule. So it's a special resolution. Uh, so that's a far, far higher number. So if the, but going back to Solna's point. Sorry, Bruno, um, 75, 75% in favor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now going back to Solna's point, the problem now with asking a room full of people to make a decision on the loan that gives them some level of short-term gratification is exactly the issue that we're experiencing throughout our country uh, and, and just general lending. That's how microloans have become so popular because it's, it, you know, you buy things that you shouldn't be buying that you can't afford because it feels cheap because you seems like you're paying very little over a long period of time, but it's not really the case. You'll end up paying back double, uh, triple with microloans. It's a stupid amount. Um, so to the viewer's point, can it be done? It has to be done in a specific way, right? Are these uh, members or these homeowners actually knowledgeable enough or um, clued up enough rather informed are they well informed to actually be able to make this vote that's a completely different question and I think I think the approach isn't so much a legal approach as it is more education approach giving examples and how bad something like this could be taking out credit works there's good credit and bad credit and unless this is a short-term plan with an outcome, like a business rescue plan, it just doesn't make sense because long-term long-term credit to try to fix a situation where you have defaulting uh, uh, owners makes no sense because you, that's not going to fix the defaulting owners. It's just going to patch the problem. And in two years' time, you're going to have the same issue and you haven't actually like um, fixed the core of the issue. Um, but uh, so again, I digress. If let's assume that the, the, the trustees took out this loan, didn't tell the owners, and the owners are appalled by this because none of them would have ever voted in favor of this, then you might have recourse to be able to um, uh, declare the agreement void. Um, typically, this happens, especially, uh, well, obviously it is void because the decision wasn't properly made. So there's no authority to enter into that contract. Problem is that a lot of situations in our law 
protect third parties who may come across as innocent because they genuinely didn't know. So if for some reason it would appear that the lender genuinely didn't know and assume that the right authority was passed, it could be a bit of a problem. If, on the other hand, you can come right to declare it void, the other downside is you do still have to pay back the capital amount. So worst case scenario, you've got an agreement you don't want. A best case scenario, you still have to pay back the capital amount. So if the trustees have used it up, you, you're already sitting with a bit of a problem. Um, and then, but that's a conversation for another day, whether the NCA can be applied to these specific type of loans. Uh, but that's, yeah, that is quite a long story because there's different views and versions of this. Uh, the general view of consensus is that sh it should be able to apply. Um, the lender does need to be registered as a national credit provider. The threshold is zero, so any loan would apply. Uh, but yeah, that's that's something that uh, we need a bit more time to, to go through, but it is something to consider as well. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Salman, for, for this valuable information. Um, we've, we've run out of time for today's session, but uh, there was a question that was asked by Ricky Khan. Ricky, I have noted your question, and we definitely will be raising it at our next forum or the next webinar that we're having. Um, and to our viewers, thank you again for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. And please post your questions in the comment section or on the group itself, and we definitely will get through to it. Uh, today was a jam-packed session. We covered quite a bit of topics. Uh, so apologies if your question was not answered, but we definitely will make time for it as we progress. Uh, as always, thank you, Selna. Thank you, Bruno. And thank you to the viewers. Please tune in next week, guys. We really, really have a lot of fun, uh, you know, answering your questions and tackling uh, the concerns and issues that you raise on a weekly basis. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Selna. Thanks, Bruno. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, <laughs> cheers. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers.